so high resolution transmission spectroscopy um, using the cross correlation technique. Um, remember that the meeting is uh, recorded, so you're going to find the YouTube recording later on uh, on YouTube as well. And also remember that you have like a dedicated Slack channel for both of the two sessions today that we are going to have. Um, at this point, I'm going to leave the floor to either Nuria or Julia. Yep. Okay, uh, let me share. Just one last thing, like if you want to ask any questions, remember just to ask them on the um, on the Zoom chat. Thank you so much. Okay, can you see the screen, the presenter? Yes. Okay, and the the cursor, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, then, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the lecture about narrowband transmission spectroscopy. Uh, the main goal of this lecture is to learn the main steps to extract the transmission spectrum of an exoplanet around single lines uh, using high resolution observations. And here in particular, we will focus on the sodium lines. Uh, Julie and I have organized this lecture in two parts. The first is an introductory talk uh, that I will, uh, where I will explain the main steps to extract the transmission spectrum of an exoplanet at high resolution. And then the second part, which will be led by Julia, is the, the practice itself, where you can follow the code and try to extract yourself uh, the transmission spectrum from real observations. So with this said, uh, we kind of start the lecture. So first of all, uh, I think uh, the first thing that we need to do is to uh, talk about transmission spectroscopy. We have already heard about that in the previous lectures, but I think it's uh, useful to repeat it. Um, so uh, the transmission spectroscopy technique is based on the comparison between data, the data taken uh, during the transit and that, those observations taken when the planet is not transiting. Uh, when we observe before or after the transit, uh, what we are obtaining is basically uh, only the stellar light. So if we focus on uh, these uh, illustrations here, you need to imagine that this is one spectral feature from the, from the stars, the stellar spectrum. But then we move uh, to the, during the transit, what we observe is that uh, the planet is occulting part of the, the light from the star that we receive. So the overall spectrum is uh, fainter, but also part of this um, a stellar light goes through the atmosphere of the exoplanet. And hopefully uh, we are able to detect this extra absorption produced by uh, the presence of this uh, exoplanet atmosphere. So uh, in transmission spectroscopy, our main goal is to find these extra absorptions uh, in the observations. But here we are talking about a high resolution spectroscopy. And this means that we are uh, using observations at resolution powers uh, higher than 50,000. Um, and for this reason, we have a lot of accuracy in wavelengths. Uh, so we are able to resolve the radial velocities of the different objects involved in our observations which are the Earth, uh, the, the exoplanet, and the star. Uh, here I show you an illustration uh, where you see uh, the, the observations. This is a, a model, um, but uh, where you can see the, these um, the expected uh, observations for a particular uh, system at different orbital phases of the planet. And uh, the first thing that you can observe is that there are uh, vertical uh, features that are not changing in time. And these are, the spec these are expected to be uh, the, the features, the spectral features from the star and the Earth, uh, because our model is constant or static uh, during uh, the observations. However, we, have all, we can also observe uh, these white uh, features, which are moving really fast <clears throat> during the, the orbital phase of the planet. And these are the spectral features from the exoplanet atmosphere. And this is because the planet is moving really fast along the orbit. So it's changing its radial velocity uh, around, uh, well, tens of kilometers per second um, during the transit, for example. And this is easy to see at high resolution, this change. So uh, in high resolution, we take advantage of this uh, change in radial velocity of the different objects. Um, yes, so as we are talking about transmission spectroscopy, we focus on transit observations. If we focus on during the transit, and we observe a little bit before uh, the transit, we basically see only the stellar light. But then when we move to uh, the beginning of the transit, from the beginning to the mid-transit time, the planet is moving 
towards the observer, which means that it has a negative radial velocity. And for this reason, the spectral features from the exoplanet atmosphere are blue shifted with respect of this stellar spectrum. When we move to the center, uh, this uh, the radial velocity of the planet is zero, and this means that both are aligned. But when we move to the second half of the transit, uh, the exoplanet has a positive radial velocity because it's moving away from the observer. And this means that the spectral features that we expect to observe are redshifted. And after the transit, we observe again only the stellar contribution. So our uh, objective here is to isolate these small spectral features produced by the exoplanet atmosphere by comparing the data taken at different, uh, so after the transit and the data taken during the transit. And what we would expect to see is something uh, like this. Uh, here you are observing these uh, small features once they have been isolated before the transit. So this is time before the transit, during and after the transit. Uh, before and after, we don't expect to see any additional absorption. But during the transit, we expect to see this extra absorption produced by the exoplanet atmosphere and which is changing in radial velocity um, well, with time. So uh, here we need observations uh, at high resolution. And for that, we use high resolution spectrographs. Um, and here I am showing some of them. Uh, there are more, but here I show uh, the ones uh, that have been uh, recently publishing a lot of uh, papers about uh, this technique which are Carmenes, Harps North, Harps Espresso, or HDS uh, at Subaru. But uh, I would like to stress that there are, there are more uh, spectrographs. Um, OK, so once we have the observations, which are basically time series uh, of a spectra, of a stellar spectra obtained a little bit before, during, and after the transit, uh, what we obtain is something uh, like this. Here I am showing uh, real data um, obtained with the Espresso for a particular star. And each, uh, each color that you see here is one observed spectrum. So it's here where we have the contribution of the star, the Earth, and also uh, hopefully uh, the exoplanet atmosphere. And from here, we want to obtain the transmission spectrum of the exoplanet. Uh, we can also show this uh, individual uh, spectra in terms of these dim two-dimensional maps that I'll be, I'll be showing uh, during my talk. Um, here, these maps, you can interpret them uh, as each row of these maps is one spectrum, one of these observed spectra. And then the first of the night, it's here at the beginning, and the last spectrum of the, of the night is here at the end. So we have first the, be, uh, the beginning, so before the transit, during the transit, and after the transit. Then here we have wavelengths, and in colors, the color bar shows the, the flux, or in this case, the count of the spectrum. So in these vertical lines, you are observing these uh, absorption lines, which are shown in, in the yellow color. So once we have our observations, we need to apply uh, uh, several steps to go through uh, all the, um, the analysis and obtain the transmission spectrum. Um, these are here I've summarized uh, the main steps that we need to follow. First, we need to correct uh, the telluric contamination, which is the contamination from the Earth's atmosphere. Then we need to normalize the data. Now we will see that this normalization, uh, we don't need to do this normalization right here in the second step, but we can do it in the different moments of the process. Then we need to align all our data, all our observations to this stellar dress frame where all the spectral lines from the star fall exactly at the same position. Then we need to remove the stellar contribution because what we want is the planetary contribution. Then we move, uh, we need to uh, shift all the planetary features uh, to their uh, rest frame, which is the planet rest frame. And finally, combine all this uh, contribution from the planet uh, to obtain the transmission spectrum. These six steps are the main ones, but then uh, we could add possi other possible uh, corrections uh, that I will briefly go through. Um, so the first one is the telluric correction. We have observed already in the Molecfic lecture uh, that uh, the main absorbers uh, from the Earth are the in the optical range are the are water and O2, and these are the ones that we mainly water is the one that we find in in the sodium lines, around the sodium lines. And one of the tools that we can use to correct this absorption is uh, Molecfit, as we were observing before. And then we also have another contrib telluric contribution, which is the uh, telluric emission. The telluric emission is not corrected with uh, molecfit, 
and we need to use a different methodologies to to correct this emission. Um, here I am showing, uh, for example, around the sodium lines for a particular star. These are the the core of the stellar lines. We see here this sodium emission uh, from the Earth, this bump that we observe here. And depending on the radial velocity of this star and the Earth in, in a particular night, it could happen that this absurd, this emission falls in a re, in the region that we want to study. So um, this could be a problem, and this needs to be considered. Uh, on the other hand, if we focus, for example, on the helium lines in the near infrared, uh, in this region we find this uh, typical uh, telluric emission, which is basically OH from the Earth. Uh, the way of correcting this kind, these emissions uh, from our data for uh, spectrographs that use uh, fibers is basically, uh, well, one of the methodologies that it's uh, used is basically to um, monitor the sky with the second fiber. So in one fiber, we have the, the spectrum of the star, and with the other fiber, we are monitoring this, the sky. So um, we have basically simultaneous observations of the star and the sky. And if, and if we check those, the sky spectrum, uh, we can know if that night there were some emission, and we can use this sky spectrum to correct our uh, science observations. The second step is the normalization. Uh, as I was saying, you know, the normalization can be done here or in another moment of the process, as we will see in the tutorial. And um, there are different ways of normalizing the spectra. And here I am uh, showing uh, one of the easiest ways, uh, but of course it depends on the data that we are using. Uh, maybe this is uh, this way is not useful for us. But here, as I am using basically synthetic observations to show the process, for me it's easier to apply this methodology. In this case, I am basically finding the continuum level and dividing uh, each individual spectrum by its continuum level. And we go from the non-normalized uh, data to the normalized observations. And here, what we are observing is basically uh, the stellar spectrum around the, the sodium doublet. This is the first and the second line of the, of the doublet. OK, so uh, the third step, which is one of the, the most important steps that we need uh, to apply, is the, uh, to move all our observations to the stellar dress frame. And to do that, uh, we need to consider that we are observing from the Earth, and the Earth is moving uh, during the observations. Uh, we are observing an, a star, uh, an extrasolar system, which is approaching to the Earth or to the solar system or moving away of the, from the solar system. But we are also observing an, a star, which inside this extrasolar system has a movement around the body center, because it, uh, the extrasolar system body center, because it has a planet orbiting around. So these are the three uh, radial velocities that we need to consider to move, uh, to move our observations from the terrestrial rest frame uh, to the uh, stellar dress frame. And in the stellar dress frame, we expect all the spectral lines from the star to be aligned uh, perfectly in the, at the same position. Um, so, uh, for example, if we focus on the stellar motion, which is the, the movement of the star around the very center, this stellar motion is the, of the order of meters per second. Uh, it's usually, for depending on the, the spectrograph that we are using, it could be not important because it's really small, but it's something that uh, we need to, to consider. On the other hand, uh, and also this stellar motion is time, time dependent, so each spectrum has one value because it depends on the orbital phase. Also, we have the system velocity. The system velocity is how uh, this extrasolar system is approaching or moving away from the solar system, and it's of the order of kilometers per second. And this is a constant value. It's only one value per, uh, during the night of observation. And finally, we also have the Earth uh, radial velocity. Uh, the movement of the Earth during one night, it's not that big. Uh, the overall uh, velocity is of the, of the order of kilometers per second, but inside one night, uh, this radial velocity is not changing a lot. But uh, still, it's time dependent, and one uh, each um, a spectrum that we want to uh, align uh, has its own value. Um, here, I am showing you only for as an example uh, the the stellar motion of a particular star, and we, if we focus during the transit, what we observe is that. For this particular case, for example, uh, the radial velocity change 
between the first and the last exposure uh, is not that big, but the overall uh, velocity, which is the system velocity, in this case, it's around minus 15 kilometers per second. And this is a big uh, red, red chip, uh, sorry, blue chip of the lines. So, uh, for example, and in our example of the, this synthetic data, what we have is that uh, before uh, in our, in the observer rest frame, um, so how we uh, directly obtain the, the observations, um, this, the, the spectrum is in this case is blue, is blue shifted. So uh, the, the spectral lines, the two sodium lines are not centered where we would expect them. These are the laboratory values of the sodium lines. So to move from the observer rest frame to the stellar rest frame, uh, we need to apply uh, the Doppler effect uh, to move uh, from one uh, rest frame to the other and considering these radial velocities that I was showing before. And um, we can show also these, uh, these figures in terms of maps, which is uh, as I was, uh, I think I showed some of them before. So each row here is one spectrum that I am showing here. So we see the evolution in time of these uh, data time series that we have around the sodium lines. So before the, in the observer rest frame, we see that the two sodium lines are shifted, but when we move to the stellar rest frame, these lines, these two sodium absorption lines become uh, on the position of the laboratory position of the sodium lines. And one thing that I didn't mention is that some spectrographs uh, are already uh, show the, the pipelines already consider the radial velocity correction of the Earth's atmosphere. So there, we need to be sure if uh, in our observations this correction has already been applied or not. Okay, so the first step, uh, step that we need to apply is to remove the stellar contribution. And to do that, we basically compute a master out of transit spectrum, which is basically the combination of all the out of transit data that we have. And we divide each individual spectrum by this master out of transit spectrum. Uh, as you can imagine, this master out of transit spectrum, as is the combination of a lot of out of transit data, it has a high signal to noise. Here I am showing you uh, in colors, it's this uh, in purple and yellow, you see the individual observations. And in this blue line, you see the master out of transit spectrum, which shows uh, high signal to noise in comparison with the individual uh, spectra. So once we divide each individual uh, spectrum by this master out, uh, what we obtain are basically noise, this noise that we observe here. And it's in this moment, uh, where we would expect to see some absorption uh, from the exoplanet uh, atmosphere, at least not now, but hidden inside uh, this noise, if detectable. Um, okay, so in these maps, I show again uh, the, the same as here. So it's basically the stellar um, spectra around the two sodium lines. And after the division by the master out, these uh, residuals ordered in time look like uh, what I show here. And here we can see different uh, contributions. So if we zoom in, uh, what we see is basically that we have a lot of noise uh, in the line score. And this is because the, the, there is a lower uh, signal to noise inside the, the stellar line score, which is propagated and which appears here in all our uh, time series. But then we also have another shadow here uh, which is the exoplanet atmosphere. And you can see that it only happens during the transit and also in, that it's shifted in, in radial velocities, or at least it's visually, we can tentatively see that it's, it shows some, some slope. Uh, sometimes it's useful to, for better visualization to basically smooth some of these maps and see if uh, the, 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 um, the maps look more, look more clear. For example, here, maybe it's better uh, to see this absorption than, than here. Okay, so the, the next step is to move all these residuals, which are now in the stellar dress frame, to the planet dress frame. In the planet dress frame, they become all aligned um, uh, so that the, the absorption becomes vertical. And for to do this, uh, to translate from the stellar dress frame to the planet dress frame, we need to follow basically uh, the, same, the approach that we were uh, doing to go from the observer to the uh, stellar test frame, which is basically applied the Doppler effect 
and consider uh, the, in this case, the radial velocity of the exoplanet. The radial velocity of the planet is also time dependent. So we have one value of radial velocity, which is different uh, for each exposure and because it depends on the orbital phase of the planet. And it depends also on the uh, Kp value, which is the uh, radial velocity semi-amplitude of the, the exoplanet. Uh, so first we see that uh, the exoplanet is, uh, shows a blue shifted uh, spectral features at the beginning of the transit and moves to uh, red shifted. So with these radial velocities, we can move from the star, from the stellar to the planet frame. And once we are here, we can combine all the in-transit uh, residuals, all the in-transit uh, features that we have and to obtain the transmission spectrum of the planet. Here, it's really easy to see the absorption uh, of the exoplanet in the two sodium lines, basically because it's synthetic data and I injected a big absorption. But in real observations, as we will see in the tutorial, uh, this is not that easy. And sometimes it's useful to be a little bit in wavelength, our transmission spectrum, to see uh, the things, what is going on there a bit clearer. Um, another uh, tip is that, for example, you see that we have been, um, we have this big noise here, so uh, it is useful to, you, to use, uh, instead of using the simple mean uh, when combining all these residuals, to use the weighted mean, so we give less importance to the pixels we have, which have higher uh, error bars, larger error bars, because of the noise inside the line score. So this is something that we may want to consider when combining these residuals. Okay, so we've got our transmission spectrum, but uh, once we are here, uh, there are other things that we should consider, and I will go really briefly on into this. I only want to mention that uh, there are other effects that can uh, influence our transmission spectrum because uh, they affect to the stellar lines profile. And as you have seen, we are trying to measure really tiny uh, absorption features uh, which are hidden in the um, stellar spectrum. So if we have additional uh, deformations of these stellar lines during the transit, they can influence our uh, transmission spectrum. And this is the case of the center to variation and the rossi maglaffin effect, for example. These two effects depend on the kind of system that we are analyzing because they are strongly dependent on the velocity of the planet and the, the architecture of the system. Here you have some examples how uh, of the shape and the impact of these effects on the transmission spectra. So you can see that depending on the object that you are observing, uh, maybe they are not important, but at least we should quantify uh, these effects to be sure that they don't influence our uh, results. Also, um, well, here it's just uh, to show you some observations where uh, these effects have been observed uh, for different uh, planets. For some of them are not important in the transmission spectrum but for others are really important for a better interpretation of the result. So uh, one of the uh, more important uh, um, slides in this talk is this one, which is basically that once we have our transmission spectrum, we need to be sure uh, if the, what we, the absorption that we observe has planetary origin. And to do that, there are several uh, tests that we can do. For example, we can compute the two-dimensional tomography maps, which are the ones I've been showing all the time during the talk. And where in these uh, maps, we expect to see the absorption only happening during the transit and also tilted uh, with the expected uh, velocity. But of course, uh, these maps are useful for high signal-to-noise observations. If our signal-to-noise is really low, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to distinguish uh, the absorption from the noise. On the other hand, we can compute, for example, the Empirical Monte Carlo. You have more information in Redfield until 2008. And this is a test where we run, randomize the data and see that the absorption that we detect can only be recovered uh, when the correct in and out of transit data is selected. Also, we have the transmission, we can calculate the transmission light curves and see that the absorption only appears during the transit. Or we can also, um, for example, check uh, other lines as reference, et cetera. So at least we should apply some of these tests to be sure that what we see is uh, has planetary origin. So we move uh, to the interpretation of the transmission spectrum. I'll go really briefly on this. 
but uh, the first thing that we usually do is to fit a Gaussian profile to these absorption lines. And this Gaussian profile gives us an idea of the position, the width, and the depth of these lines. And with that, uh, we can have some idea of what is going on on the uh, on the atmosphere of the planet. For example, if the lines uh, show a, a blue or red shift, we can say that uh, there is um, an overall uh, wind, blue or, uh, or or red shift wind in the atmosphere of the of the exoplanet. But of course, we need more. Um, uh, complex modeling uh, to infer, for example, temperature uh, where these uh, these species in the, of the layers where these lines form, or uh, broadening effects that could be produced by winds uh, in the atmosphere of the the exoplanet. Um, some of the results, uh, some of the results about the interpretation of the transmission spectrum are going to be shown in during the conference. And then I'll leave basically this slide here. Uh, only to this is only to mention that we can translate the absorption level um, that we see in the transmission spectrum to uh, more, let's say, physical units uh, to have an idea, for example, of the scale hikes uh, of this absorption level that we observe or the radius of the planet. Of course, these are always uh, making some assumptions, but at least we can have. Um, uh, an idea of where these lines form or a, a little bit more physical explanation. So I'll finish here and then now I'll go, I'll explain a little bit the, the tutorial, the practice. Uh, this is based on the sodium in was 76 b Our target uh, is an ultra hot Jupiter, which are extreme planets with temperatures higher than 2000 Kelvin. Uh, currently we know uh, not a lot of ultra hot Jupiters. I think it's around 40. And uh, West 76 is one of these ultra hot Jupiters, but with the low, one of the lowest uh, density ultra hot Jupiters. So this is one of the uh, good uh, characteristic for transmission spectroscopy studies. Nuria, yep. you have a question now that you've finished. And, and uh, Hossein is asking, we can simply remove the sky emission by subtracting each spectrum with corresponding fiber B spectrum. Is there another method? Uh, yeah, so what happens is that, yes, I've, I've applied this uh, technique, but we need to, the first thing that you need to be sure is that the efficiency between fibers is exactly the same because if you remove, yeah, for example, carmines, uh, the two fibers are not, uh, the, the efficiency between fibers is really different. So when you subtract to the one to the other, you are not removing completely this emission. And on the other hand, when you do this sub direct subtraction, you are adding noise from fiber B. So uh, usually what should, uh, what is more convenient maybe is to first fit with Gaussian profile, for example, your emission in this fiber B observations, and then remove this fitting from your uh, science observations. Okay. Um, then, uh, well, this is the, the tutorial and we will see more about this planet and ultra hot Jupiters in general uh, during the conference. And well, so the objective of this uh, practice or this tutorial is to extract the transmission spectrum of was 76 b around the sodium lines. And the data that uh, we are gonna use is the one HARPS, uh, one transit observation with HARPS. And the same uh, data has been used by uh, Seidel et al. 2019, uh, together with two more transits uh, detecting uh, the sodium absorption in uh, in the atmosphere uh, produced by the atmosphere of this planet and here i leave you other studies that have used uh, have also obtained uh, the sodium uh, absorption from uh, this atmosphere using espresso or the interpretation of the sodium lines and now i'll finish here and i'll let julia to continue with the tutorial uh, Elia, your hand is raised what can we do for you? Hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Quick question. So you you mentioned that you normalize all the individual spectra before, um, well, <clears throat> adding the out of transit ones and then removing it. Uh, is that really necessary? Because to me, it seems like every time you fit with a polynomial, the out of transit, you're adding some uncertainty, right? And at the end, you don't expect the continuum to change from once. So why is, why is that even necessary, uh, normalizing? 
And you mean the normalization at the beginning. So basically normalize the spectra. It's not necessary to be applied at the beginning. So uh, for example, in the tutorial, we just apply all the process. And then at the end where you have the, your transmission spectrum, for example, around 0 point something, you normalize there. And, so, and there you just normalize by the mean or median or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, great. Yeah, that's exactly. for me, that makes sense. Excellent. Mm. Uh, it, for me, it was easier to show the normalization at the beginning because then you have nice maps to show. But... Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me share the screen. Oh. Okay. So, um, we're going to do a little bit of hands on practice. So, in the chat, I shared the link to the collab and I'd ask all of you to then click on file and to make a copy of this to your own drive so that you can play around in your own file and not everybody's going to see what you're deleting and doing. And um, then we can dive right in. Now I just have a question. So when people um, want to answer or can they just unmute themselves or do you prefer if we do it in the chat to be the organizers maybe? Well, they can raise uh, the hand and I can unmute them. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's do that. So what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes is that we'll do basically step-by-step step what Nodia has explained to you in the lecture. And we're just going to go through it. And on an actual scientific data set, we're going to try and do the main steps of it. And at the very end, you might or might not find sodium. Let's see. So um, if you're super keen on diving more into this, so this is data, as Nodia said, on WASP-76b from an observation taken back in 2012. And it's part of a larger data set that is also publicly available on the ESO archive because it's been quite old. So if, if you think I'll now apply all of the Mollick fit and transmission spectrum knowledge that I've gathered, you can just go to the ESO archive, download that data set and have some fun with it. If you wanna have the spoiler, you can also check out this paper that I linked here where I've done all of this shenanigans for you. So there's some assumptions that we are gonna have to make basically just because for the lack of time. So we can't just recode an entire scientific paper in 40 minutes, that would be really nice, but no. So um, I've already done the Tiller correction with more like fit for us. So we don't have to do that now right on the spot and wait for 24 hours. Um, I already had a look at the data quality. So the first thing that you normally do is like you plot all of the spectra, you have a look at them. Um, if there are some that, uh, that you know, you want to get rid of because the signal to noise ratio is not good enough because you can already see that there's some form of contamination just by eye once, once you are a little bit more trained. Then I also assume that we know the system parameters quite well so that we know the ephemeris. Um, that we have all of the necessary information from the file headers. Uh, we know all of the velocities um, of the different parts of the system that I'll talk about in a second. Now, we haven't talked really a lot about the Russell to McLaughlin effect, which is basically um, the double of the stellar spectrum from the rotation of the star to be very broad in the explanation. This is something that you will always have to assess and most of the time also correct for because uh, otherwise you can even think you detect um, resolved spectral lines when it you don't. So there's uh, basically all of the papers by Nuria, you can have a look. And um, if you do analysis yourself and you're like, oh, I know everything, but I don't know how to do, um, how to do that, then just get yourself somebody who's an expert in the Rossiter McLaughlin effect and outsource that. That's what I normally do. And then um, I also assume that we assessed um, where the planetary signal will roughly lie, how it would look like in the overlap with the stellar spectrum, and just a few things that we're not going to do. Like, for example, we don't care right now about error propagation at all. All right, let's dive right in. We need some dependencies. So shift return the cell to execute it, and hopefully it will load some very low level dependencies to NumPy and some, some plotting stuff in Python, Python that we're gonna need. It did that, nice. And then 
Um, I already, as I said, took care of most of the cleanup steps. So um, I just saved all of the data, the different velocities, um, and so on in uh, files that I loaded to GitHub. So we're going to load that from GitHub real quick. And we're going to load all of these files that we just cloned from GitHub into arrays that we can now play with. So what you can see here is the first thing is a two-dimensional array um, of the data. So just all of the exposures taken at different steps in time during the transit in one two-dimensional array. Then we have something that's phase, that's a Boolean array. And it basically just tells you for every exposure that was taken, was this taken while the planet was in transit or was this taken um, while the planet was elsewhere around the star. So it's just false, false, false. At some point it switches to true when the planet pushes itself in front of the stellar disk. And then it's true, 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 true. And the moment it leaves, it sets to false again. And this is super practical. And I don't know if most of you know this, but I learned this at the beginning of my PhD. In Python, you can use Boolean arrays to index lists. So for example, if we would use this data array that we have, and we would use phase uh, to index the data array, then we would have the fantastic thing happen that we would only have the exposures left that were taken in transit because everything that is false would be discarded. And we're gonna make use of that heavily in the next 40 minutes. And then we have um, the wavelength solution that we get from the header for Espresso, for example, that we can uh, get in an extra file for heart. And then we have three arrays full of um, velocities. So we have how fast does the star move, relatively speaking, the host star of the exoplanet. Then we have the velocity of the planet while it moves around the star. And then we have the so-called BIRF, and the BIRF is the barycentric Earth radial velocity. So that's a fancy word for how, far, how fast are we moving while we observe this exoplanet, because to us, we are stationary, but um, to the exoplanet, we move around the very center of our own solar system. And we have to take care out of all of these. There's also the system velocity, which basically just says how fast is this other system where this exoplanet is moving towards or away from our solar system. And Nuria already explained this in the lecture. These velocities are super important because um, they basically introduce Doppler shifts to our spectra, and we have to think very carefully about all of them to then finally move from the observations that we have that are in the rest frame of us, the observer, and realign them back where they came from in the rest frame of the exoplanet where the interaction of the light with the atmosphere actually happened. All right, the first thing we always do when we get new data is we just have a quick look at an exposure to see how this looks like. Like, okay, this looks kind of pretty. We are definitely in the right order. We can see two very, very deep lines. That's the stellar sodium. It's already kind of neat. So we know, okay, the wavelength grid, there's definitely wavelengths down here. And then the data grid also seems to have some exposures in it. So we're, we're definitely on the right track. So this is just a tiny summary of what I just explained to you what's in the, in, um, the, the NumPy files that we loaded. And now let's get a little bit to the actual work of it. So the first step that we have to take is that we need to shift all of these spectra into the stellar rest frame. And um, what does that actually mean, shifting into the stellar rest frame? So what do we have to do? And what purpose does that serve? Like, why, why do we do that if we want to extract the transmission spectrum? You just have to raise your hand if you if you think you know what's happening. If nobody volunteers, we will volunteer somebody, yeah? So please. <laughs> I volunteer Nuria. <laughs> Three, two. Yeah, I can just answer if you don't mind. Um, so we want to have all the stellar lines in alignment so that we can create um, a master out of transit spectrum 
to remove the cellar lines. Very good. That's exactly what we want to do. So we need to shift into the cellar rest frame, get all the lines that come from the star together, and then get rid of them in the most efficient way so that we only have the rest that comes from the planet. All right, so there's one complication that already comes in because we all know the Doppler shift from various applications of it. So we know it's one plus lambda over C and it goes, it's a wavelength shift. But um, the wave, wavelength solution of the spectrographs, they're not constant. Um, normally the dispersion grids are constant in pixel size, meaning that every single pixel corresponds to a certain velocity shift. So, which means that the spacing in velocity, the further you go uh, in, in the orders will change. That's not a big deal. It just means that we do everything in velocity space and not in wavelength space, but the two are completely equivalent. So that means from now on, we think about velocities instead of thinking about wavelengths. And when we think about velocities, now we have to think about, okay, in between us and the host star, what are all the elements that are moving that will introduce a shift to um, the spectra that we see? So we have all of the velocities already loaded and now we ha just have to select the ones that are interesting for us right in this moment when we wanna go into the stellar rest frame. Somebody wants to hazard a guess and if you're very brave, you can also tell me what sign uh, he would attach to it, if it's minus moving away from us or if it's plus moving towards us. No hands on yet. Come on guys. Well, I'll give one. Uh, your systemic velocity, and it is going to be a plus sign because positive systemic velocities are away from us. Is that right? I mean, honestly, with that one, it really depends a little bit on what uh, on what uh, convention one uses. So I, I I wouldn't be too harsh with a plus or minus sign for the systemic velocity. To be honest, <laughs> I normally just test it. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing and I do that with fine. all of them. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I normally do that also with all of them, but for the systemic velocity in this specific case, because I have the minus sign oh, here, right. uh, I also set the minus sign when I do this double shift. That was it depends. One. It depends. Okay, so we have the system velocity. Yes. Now, can I take one? Um, Dominique is saying by center velocity. Yes. Also, very good. Nicolas, uh, the velocity of the star. Yes, all right, very good. So here we are. We have to take care of these three and then hopefully we'll end up where we want to be, which is in the star rest frame. Okay, cool. All right, so now we know what is the overall velocity that we need to shift for. It's the combination of these three velocities that you just mentioned. And we know that one bin, so one element of HARPS is 820 meters per second wide in velocity. So now we have to calculate the overall velocity of all of the shifts by putting the different velocities together correctly. And then we need to find a way to shift all of these spectra in a way that makes sense for the half spectrograph. Now this is, this is a little bit tricky so I'm going to help you with this and you don't have to do this by yourself. So, because what we're going to do is basically when you normally do a Doppler shift, you change your um, wavelength grid. So you say, okay, before that I was at 580 angstroms and now I do the shift and I shift my velocity grid to say 590 angstroms. What we're going to do instead is because we're in velocity space and we have already this grid of bins where our, um, our spectra were recorded, that instead we're gonna shift the bins. So we leave our velocity grid as it is basically, and then we just shift the spectra on top of it because this is a relative action and really doesn't matter whether we touch 
the wavelength period or whether we touch the actual data. So that what we're going to do is um, we're going to calculate how many bins it has to be shifted. Let's say our velocity would be 10 kilometers per second. Then we divide that by the 820 meters per second, and we know how many bins our spectrum would be shifted to the left or to the right, depending. That has obviously one problem. If we do that, and the first velocity is, say, minus 10 kilometers per second, but the second spectra, because um, the Earth just turned in the other direction, now it's plus 10 meters per second, they'll be shifted like this. And one will have left over in the blue arm, and one will ha have left over in the right arm, and they don't overlap anymore. So in the end, that might mean that for the edges of these shifts, for the edges of your orders, you don't have all of the exposures aligned anymore. You have maybe just one or two. So you have much less data there. And we'd want to avoid that, possibly, because then you'll get like artifacts and it looks, looks kind of kind of skinny. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the maximum shift that can happen with the velocities that we have for our system. That's what this function does. So you just give it the list of velocities that you have created. And then it will, with a correct pixel size for the half spectrograph, it will tell you how large is the maximum shift that will happen for one of these spectra that you'll look at. And then you just say, okay, this is the maximum. So I'll just cut that off as, let's say, security on both sides, because this is where I know that I will not have all of the spectra, not all of the data anymore. And we just focus on whatever's left. Normally, that's really not a big deal. So you have this very large grid with thousands of bins, and normally you, you'd use like maybe 10 or 15 on both sides. So this is really not a big deal. And this is what we're going to do in the first step. And then we're going to do the actual shift. And I already did kind of the framework for the function that will do our shifting. And the cool thing is that obviously we can reuse this function until the end of time. So whenever we do any form of shift to spectra, we can use this. And we only have to do, have to do this function once. So we give it, we call this velocity ribbing. We give this the total velocity grid that you've said is the birth together with the velocity of the star together with the system velocity. Then we give it a bin set that is just from zero to however many bins is in our data set. Then we'll give it the data. We'll give it the wave set. We'll give it the maximum cutoff that we have calculated using this function here. And it will also need the pixel size. Because what's happening here now is that first we calculate, OK, what is in this particular spectrum that I'm looking at right now? How much do I have to shift this? What is the velocities that this particular spectrum has seen on its way? So we take the velocity, we divide it by the pixel size, and then we know, OK, this is the amount of pixels that we need to shift it. And then I have three little work packages here for you, basically. The first one is, OK, we need to think about the bins, and we need to think about the wave grid. We need to cut these down um, to the size that we want to have in the end to avoid these uh, edge effects, so to say. And then we want to do the actual shift. And because there's plenty of interpolation functions in this world, I provided you with the one that I think is best suited for this for this exercise, which is from the Python interpolate package. It's called interpolated univariant spline. And I wrote a tiny little wrapper for it so that you have all the information what it actually does right here in the notebook. All right. If you want, you can uh, try your own hand at it. I'll just code it real quick. So if you're a little bit lost in the void, either because Python is not your forte, or because this whole shifting business is a little bit weird, then you can also just follow along here. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, basically think about this from first principles. So I'm like, OK, I already know that the set of bins, that's just the numeration of the bins, that's not going to change, basically. 
So that's just my old bin set that I had before. And I'm just cutting off the two edges where I say, okay, I don't want those. All of this stuff is superfluous. And now I've cut it down to what I know will still have the full information of all of the different exposures. Even if I shift them, there will be nothing um, that has nans or zeros in there. And then I do the very same thing also for the wave set grid. All right, perfect. So I'm done with these two things because we said we're gonna leave our wave grid alone and we're gonna shift the spectra itself. So now we have to actually go and do that. So I'm gonna define a new grid that I call data pick shift. And I'll say, okay, I don't uh, really know yet what I wanna do with it. So I'm just gonna make something empty for now. And then we fill it with stuff. And we already know the size it's supposed to have. So we leave it like that. This is probably not needed in the next few steps. I just do it because normally when I start thinking about these kind of things in my code, I create an empty array knowing what the size is supposed to be and then I go from there. Okay. And since I don't know yet what I'm actually gonna do with this, I'm gonna create just an interim function. We'll see if we need it later. And then I say, okay, now we need to do the actual interpolation. So the interpolation function that I gave you is called spline inter. And then we go up and we check what spline inter actually needs. So we need to give it some form of X grid. That's the bins gonna be for us. And the Y grid, that's gonna be the data. Then the shifted bin grid, okay. And then how, what kind of interpolation do we want? And we're gonna do just like the linear because we are just shifting it. We don't wanna actually change the data. We just wanna shift it around a little bit. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We give it the bin set, that's our old X set. And we give it data picks, that's our old data set. And then comes the fun part because now comes the shifting it. So we have our old bin set, but now we shift it by the amount of pixels that this specific exposure that we're looking at is actually shifted. So this is all the magic. This is where the heavy lifting is done basically, where you think about how many pixels do I need to shift my data to the left and right. It looks a lot more fancy than it is. All right, cool. But now the question is, okay, now I've shifted it, but it's still the size that it was before. So it's still basically the size of bin set, but I also want to have it smaller. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I wouldn't have needed this line basically. I'm just gonna say, okay, my actual result, my data picks shift, is just gonna be, the real shifted old data that I've shifted in the correct spot. And now I'm just gonna do the same. And all of that, where I'm not really sure if I'm gonna have all of the data points there or not, I'm just gonna generously cut that off on the sides because we really don't need it. We are interested in the resolved lines and thankfully for sodium, they sit nicely in the center of the order. Okay, so now we have data pick shift, nice. We have shifted our bin set, we have shifted our wavelength set. So I think our shifting function is done. So now we can apply this. But first, we of course need to actually say what we wanna do. So we wanna have a birth. I'm cheating because I already know the signs. So if you don't want to cheat, you can also just change the signs and then have a look what happens to your, uh, to your grids, to your data when you have the wrong signs, because you see there will be lots of funky um, things happening that you might not even want. Okay, now we have all of these cool things. And now we just have to apply the functions that we just built. So first off, okay, we need to think about what's the maximum shift. 
what's the cutoff that, that we have to do. So we calculate that. We have a function for that, for that, but it's called calc max shift. And it really doesn't do anything except it goes through the entire bell stellar shift grid with the velocities. And it tells you what's the largest value of the shifts that I encounter. Yay. And of course, I need to actually execute these cells, which I haven't done, because otherwise it will do nothing. All right. Execute all of these. OK, done. Cool. What I normally like to do is then to kind of plot the before and after to see if everything worked out fine. So first, we need to think about what do we get out of here and what do we put in? So we put in here basically all of these different um, grids that we have loaded before, but Datapix is a two-dimensional grid. And here we perform a one-dimensional operation because it was easier to show you in 1D without like matrix operations what's happening. So we're just going to do the same and uh, we're going to cheat a little bit. This is very ugly. We're going to do it with a loop. When you do this to actually uh, do the job, please don't use loops. Please do matrix operations. Well, for now, it will, it, will, it will do. All right. So yeah, I'm just creating our, our bin numbering, basically. So our working hoss. So this is what A range does. It just goes from zero to a length of, of the first data element. And then I'm also going to cheat a little bit because I'm going to say, OK, my products at the end, I already know what kind of shape they're going to have. Now, when do you do this properly, you need to write an actual function that takes an array of unspecific size. But for this notebook, I don't want to overload it. So we're just going to assume we already know what's going to happen. And then we're going to plot again wave and data. Nothing has happened yet. Great. And now we're actually going to do something. So now we have to go through all of our data, which is what we're going to do here. And we're going to have the output, which is data SRF. And we're also going to label through them a bin shift. That's not important. So we're not going to even index it. And then we have our new wavelength grid that we'll also index. And then we'll have to do the ribbon and give it what we need. So this grid of velocities that is actually also you know, um, an array that goes in time through all of the exposures. But right now, we're going in time with the loop. So we're going to say val stellar shift and also index that. And then we're going to give it the bin grid that we just created as our working homes. We give it our first data set. And we're going to give it our wave, and we're going to give it the cutoff that we just calculated. And then, because it's oops, and because it's so much fun that we've done this, we actually want to check if it's done correctly. So we're going to plot what comes out at the end. So we have wave RF. Also, just take the first one. Why not? And then we have our shifted data set in the stellar rest frame. Also, let's take the first one. Oh, sorry. I made a mistake. It's Bell Ribbon. Sorry. And then let's bring this up a bit. Okay. Yay. And what you can see here is basically not a lot. But you can see that there's this blue data set at the original data set. And then you can see that the orange one is just a tad shifted and just a tad shorter because we cut something off a little bit. 
Now, when you do this, you can just change the, the X range and zoom in a bit so you can really see the shift. So that's really fun, but I'll leave that up to you. And now we basically have done the hardest part because what we do now is we basically just apply what we've done before and get rid of the stellar lines. So we create the master out. There's a lot of fancy stuff happening here. So I'm gonna show this to you step by step. So to create the master out, what we wanna do is we wanna sum up all of the data that is now in the stellar rest frame where all the stellar lines are light up. And we wanna take only the ones that are out of transit. So we take the phase and we wanna have only those elements of our data where the phase is set to false. And this is what happens here with the tiny squiggly line. So it takes the phase array, it inverts it, and then it takes that to index our data and it just sums over. And then you can uh, basically just normalize it if you want. So you just take the mean. And because NumPy is really cool, it has an actual function to do this safely. Like now you would just divide it basically, but NumPy does that for us. So we can just normalize the master out kind of nicely. And because it's so much fun, let's just plot the master out to see that that works properly. Okay, that worked fine. And then let's plot it. So that's what the master out looks like. And you can see, still see here, it's, uh, it's much cleaner than before. Yeah, Elia? Hi, sorry, sorry to bother you. So, um, so what, you, what you did was you basically calculated your uh, shifted spectra onto a common grid by using in, interpolate, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I, when I do this analysis, I do the same, but I work in uh, velocity space and I clearly see that work. Um, I work in, sorry, in wavelength space and I can see clearly velocity space is just much neater. But the worry that I always have is that when I uh, re resample my spectrum onto a new grid, so doing this interpolation, you don't necessarily res um, conserve flux. Do you not worry about that? Yes, I do. So this is why I actually did some extensive testing which one of the interpolation functions is best suited for this. And this is also like, um, it doesn't really change the overall flux here if you set this to one. Because so, it's just a linear interpolation. It really just takes whatever it has and it, it just shifts it in a very basic way. If you go up here, and you actually like interpolate over the, the data points one by one, um, then you might get problems. But I think the overall flux level is, is really quite uh, unaffected by what we're doing here because, because it's we, really just the position. We are not interested in the overall, overall flux, right? We want to actually conserve flux in the core of the sodium. Exactly. Right. And so, I, I actually realized that the only way to really do that is to oversample by a factor which is a number of all the spectra that you have and in fact you actually preserve all the sampling that you had in all the spectra this blows up your computation time but that was the only way i could think of in order to conserve flux at every point i, I, I don't know maybe this was an overkill that i, I was doing I, I i think it's a little bit overkill but overkill is never bad i mean uh, as long as it works and you're you're happy with the with the computing time, I just haven't uh, run into that issue with this particular um, way of interpolating because it has always done a sufficient job and preserved not only like the the overall shape of the data but also the flux level. So I was always very happy with it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, wait, where are we? Cool. All right, we're basically nearly done. So now we have our master out and um, we just clean up our data, which means we get rid of our stellar, of our stellar stuff. So I'm calling this in transit stellar rest frame. And what I basically do is I say, okay, now I do the opposite. I take my data that I shifted and I take all of the spectra that are in transit. So where phase, this array is set to true. I leave the tiny squiggly line up. And then I divide that just quick and dirty by the normalized master up. All right. 
And then I also cut down my wavelength array, but this is more for fun. You don't necessarily have to do this so that it also has the correct size. All right, so this is just basically. Yeah, you have five more minutes. That's fine, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. So now we have our only in transit stuff all nicely cleaned up from our stellar contribution. And now this part should be uh, kind of straightforward for you because we are basically just doing what we did above when we shifted to the stellar restaurant here. And we're going to do the same thing, but now we're going to shift into the planetary restaurant. Does somebody want to tell me which velocities we have to now take into account? So if we create another planetary shift, what do I need to, what do I need to do? Just take a Caplarian velocity of the planet? Yeah, you need the planet velocity, but also don't forget we're now in the restroom of the star. So also the... Um, hmm. Maybe there. Because all of these are relative velocities, right? They're measured um, to the very center of the system. So this, the stellar... But that was negligible, right? It's just... Uh, I mean, it's pretty because... negligible, but we want to do it correctly. <laughs> all right. Yeah, then you also had that one. I mean, the velocity of the star is normally like a few meters per second, so whatever, but you know, we're not starting like this. We're going to do this correctly. Sometimes it makes the difference between shifting from one bin to the next or not. Um, all right. And yeah, then we basically just have to do the same thing that we do before. We calculate the cutoff. Um, we initialize our grids. We cheat a little bit because we already know how big they're going to be. And then we just do the same function that we already used. We can just reuse it and give it these new velocities. And because we're running a little bit low on time, I'm just going to cheat real quick and insert that here. And I'm going to give you this exercise like with the full solution uh, in Slack. But I'd really like encourage you to try and do this step by yourself because it's really, really neat to, to get that done. And then you can see here, OK, there's something happening. It looks a little bit weird. There's already, you can see like weird things going on. It might be, might be that we have found sodium, who knows? And now it's the last step. So now we have all of our spectra neatly lined up in a planetary rest frame. We've gotten rid of all the stellar stuff. What is the last thing to see if we can actually have a planetary signal? What do we need to do? With our wonderful in-transit data cleaned up of all the stellar stuff. I want to remind everybody that we have some professors among us. So if you really want to maybe get PhD positions, uh, you should, <laughs> I encourage you to answer. Huh? That might help you with your No pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. So Nuria already explained this, right? So we have taken all of these spectra during the transit, five minutes, then the next five minutes, then the next five minutes. And now we have all of these spectra that hold like a tiny piece of information about the atmosphere. Um, and we have extracted this tiny piece of information out of all of these spectra. So now what do we have to do to puzzle it back together? Viviana is saying weighted mean. Yes, we do need to weight them. But why do we need to weight them? Well, we need to weight them because we have to sum them back up. So we kind of separated the transit out in all of these pictures that we basically took of five minutes each. And now we sum all of them back together to get this full image of the exoplanets in, in time, basically, to get the full information. We normalize that, and then we're done. And this means you've built your very first transmission spectrum. And now you can plot that. I mean, I'll just leave you to plot this to you for yourself. But because I really, really like it, and it's very neat, I'm also going to do it. So what you do is you say, OK, um, we have the shifted wavelength grid. You can take whichever you want. Then you have the transmission spectrum. 
And I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the sodium doublet so that you actually see. But you can also first plot it without that. And then you can already see, OK, there's something happening here, but this is the full order. So there's a lot of other things also happening. So what you normally do is you zoom into the sodium doublet. And there you see the need first line and the need second line, the D1 and the D2 line. And just with one Harps transit, so only one night of observations with Harps, that's only a 3.6 meter mirror, I mean, only in quotation marks, you can actually detect the resolved spectral lines of an exoplanet. And I think that's super cool. So yeah, I really encourage you to just like delete all of the answers and just try it out yourself. And then you have like a really neat handbook like already on hand if you ever want to do this yourself where all of the hard steps are already done for you. And if I completely lost you with this, like don't feel bad. I also didn't really get it the first time around. You can just write me an email or on Slack and just ask 